the business was a disaster. We got shut down in 45 countries. We burned through, you know, enough money to support the entire city of Vancouver. Like it, we, we got killed. We should not exist as a company any longer. But I think the team and our customers and our vendors took on the psyche of what it takes to be a Spartan. And we've somehow fought through. This is All Things Fitness and Wellness, uniting industry thought leaders and fitfluencers on the mission to inspire innovation and encourage people to live a life fit and well. On this episode of All Things Fitness and Wellness, I'm joined by the founder of Spartan, Joe DeSena. Joe's entrepreneurial journey began in his preteens, and by college, he built a multi-million dollar business and founded a Wall Street trading firm. His passion for fitness led him to move to Vermont, where he combined his love for ultra marathons and adventure races to create the Spartan lifestyle. Since its founding in 2010, Spartan has transformed over 7 million lives with events in more than 40 countries. Today, Joe will share his thoughts on entrepreneurship, the rise of GLP-1s, and the economic bounce back of the fitness event space. Before we get to it, be sure to hit like and subscribe. We have new podcast episodes weekly featuring industry thought leaders and influencers. I'm your host, Chrissy Van, and this is ATFW. So I'm so stoked to reconnect with you, Joe, because as we were chatting just before starting here, I met you in 2017 and I've had a long career at the time in traditional media in the mornings and generally pretty calm, sometimes tasting some food, and then you stroll in. And before I know it, it's 6 a.m. and I'm crawling under barbed wire, flipping tires, climbing over shit, tucking it in and rolling. So it is a pleasure to reconnect with you because I know I'm in for a ride. I'm glad I delivered. I, um, I think my job in life for all of humanity is to get people uncomfortable and doing stuff they don't want to do. And I'm really good at it. Yeah, which is, I mean, what we need. And we're really going to dive into that today. Before we even get into the nitty gritty, I'm curious, because when I did meet you at the time, you were traveling everywhere with a kettlebell that you quite literally checked on all of your flights. And this is back in 2017. So is this still part of the repertoire? Um, I'm sad to say that during the pandemic, things got turned upside down. It became very hard to travel with the kettlebell. And I can't tell you how many were confiscated. So when I was in one place like Vancouver or Tokyo or Singapore, it was fairly easy. And in Asia was the easiest because they would just let me on planes with the kettlebell. But um, traveling around most of the world, I, I couldn't do it. And I, people like yourself, when I would show up to a meeting, would be expecting it. So then I would have to race from the airport to go buy a new kettlebell to show up with it, lose it again on the way out. Anyway, recently I found this unbelievable little wrist curling grip strength machine. It's like, it's like this big. And about a week ago, I said, oh, this will be my new kettlebell. I could travel with this and I could use it. So I was in Saudi for the last 10 days and I was using it everywhere and I was bringing it to meetings and it's awesome. In taxi and Uber rides, I could use it. And I was just with... Um, somebody really important in Abu Dhabi and I gave it to him. So we just ordered another one, but you might start seeing me travel with that. Brilliant. So you're re-apping. Can you explain the philosophy of why you hold that around all over the globe? Sure. So number one, I'm, I'm a believer that like we've got limited time. And so any chance we get to multitask and get a workout and take stairs instead of escalators in airports or carry around something heavy, any chance we get is a home run. So or stand while you're at work. You, you guys have all heard that. Um, but specific to that kettlebell was a story on the farm where I helped a, a gentleman go from 696 pounds down to 265 pounds. And in doing so, I told him I would carry weight as he lost weight. So that turned into a hundred pound sandbag that I was carrying everywhere around the farm in Vermont. Ultimately, the 100 pounds was too much to carry. They wouldn't let it on a plane on my way to Tokyo, the sandbag. So when I landed in Tokyo, I said to my wife, would you mind ordering a kettlebell? But let's make it reasonable. Make it like a 20-pound kettlebell. I'll just carry this thing around. And by accident, we ordered 20 kilograms, which is 42 <laughs> pounds. And so that became my three-year cross to bear that you met me with was, was my kettlebell. 
Well, and I know mental toughness is such a part of who you are and really trying to instill it in other people. And, you know, at the time that we met, obviously, fitness races, challenges were on such an upswing. And then, and I know it's like we beat it to the death talking about it, but I just find it so interesting because I just did a financial fitness forecast where we talked about HVLP and boutique and the recovery and everyone returning to gyms. But I know for yourself, not only were you impacted during COVID on the fitness side of things, but you're also in an event space, which I think that double whammy must have been so challenging. So how are things recovering for you now and how did you achieve the pivot? So... First off, during the pandemic, personally, outside of the business, it was awesome for me. I never stopped traveling. I probably didn't wash my hands once. I'm I'm being facetious, obviously. I I traveled everywhere. I was at the I was at the Colosseum in Rome. I had meetings. I was at the Colosseum. There wasn't a person there. No one. I was alone. I was doing burpees at the Colosseum, and I thought this will never exist again in our lifetimes. And so I was on airplanes alone. It was awesome. Oh, just, just from an experience standpoint, the business was a disaster. We got shut down in 45 countries. We burned through, you know, enough money to support the entire city of Vancouver. Like it, we, we got killed like, like any event business or, or airline for that matter, or hotel or restaurant, we were killed. Uh, we should not exist as a company any longer, but I think the, the team and our customers and our vendors took on the uh, psyche of what it takes uh, to be a Spartan. And we've somehow fought through. And we still go through these ebbs and flows every day because we, we don't have the bulletproof balance sheet we had pre-pandemic. But, oh, my God, um, in the last 10 months, it has completely hockey stick in the sense that our races are so well attended. Um, Things are on fire in a good way. I'm still burning through a lot of the blemishes that were born and created from the pandemic from a balance sheet perspective. But but oh, my God, uh, the last time we saw it this good was 2015. So it's on fire in a good way. Yeah, it's really nice because I'm hearing that sentiment echo through so many pockets in the fitness industry. And I think for a lot of individuals, I mean, obviously you have subscribed for so long to understanding the importance of fueling our potty, right? Stepping out of our comfort zone, making sure that we show up every day. But a lot of people didn't realize that should be part of their philosophy until they hit pause and realized a lot of things were missing. This mental toughness of yourself, though, I'm really curious because it I, I love your no BS approach all the time. You're just saying it as it is. But where exactly was that seed planted in you? Because I know that you had a lot of success very early, but it was also success that you created. So can you recall where this was actually instilled with you? Yeah, I was very lucky. I grew up in a neighborhood that was um, would pride itself on being tough. It was it was ground zero for organized crime. If you saw the movie Goodfellas, that's where I grew up, right there. And so if you were doing bad things, which a lot of the people were, they had to be tough. They had to you know, be able to go to jail for 10 years. That was a badge of honor. If you weren't doing something bad and you were running a business, you had to be pretty damn resilient. You were up early in the morning. It was usually a family affair. You were going to bed late at night. It was seven days a week. You hustled. So I grew up around that. And you look, had I grown up around the best tennis players in the world or, you know, the best golfers in the world or the, or the academics of the world, that's what I would have aspired to become. But instead I grew up around a bunch of tough people that were grinders. And so I guess that's what I aspired to become. In addition, my mother uh, pushed against it and she wanted to find a healthy way to live. And she ran into a yogi in the seventies who convinced her to eat more salad and teach yoga and teach meditation. And this particular yogi believed in long distance running. So he put on a race called the Transcendence Run, a 3,100 mile race around a one mile loop. So I I got an early look at that of people running in circles for 50 to 60 days. My mom meditating for 30 days straight or fasting for 30 days straight. These guys going to jail for 25 years. So I, I grew up in a place where you know, everybody had a suck it up buttercup. There was just no tolerance for uh, complacency. And, and so that's, you know, that's how I was wired. Talk about garnering life experience from two 
polar opposite spectrums. And then now a lot of you, I mean, I'm sure there's so much to that story, but a lot of it makes sense to just be exposed to that. And the fact that you've been able to use both sides of that as such a tool is pretty impressive for yourself. Obviously, when we talk about businesses resurging, one of the issues that we're commonly hearing is labor shortages and people not wanting to do the work. So to that point of that tough it up buttercup, like how do you feel about the current climate in regards to motivating people to get work done? Because businesses still need to move forward. And to your point, they're resurging on this uphill hockey stick, which means you need people to make them run. Yeah, you know, I, I've never, I just don't appreciate lazy. I don't do well with it. I don't want to be around it. I think it's incredibly attractive, hard work. I think we like it in books and movies and in real life. We, you know, th those folks that lean in and get it done and grind their whole life. And I just don't understand. I just don't understand sitting on a beach or sitting on a couch and, you know, wasting your life away in front of a screen. I, I love to just get after it. The, the shame is that if we are soft, which we are in this generation, because in the first world, we have all the things at our fingertips, we make our kids softer and they make their kids softer. And if we're given things, which we, we've been given a ton, a ton from, from the pandemic, even with my punch in the nose and my business turning up, like all those kids and even the adult, like we don't want to go to work anymore. Like I, you see it on social media. If I was to post something and say like, everybody should get in a friggin' office, it pisses at least half the world off, if not more, because they do better at, we do better at home. And, and my answer to that, and I know I'm going to piss a bunch of people off here, but like, and I'm speaking about myself at the same time. Like, has anybody looked at the stock market and seen what Facebook, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Meta, et cetera, Google, have you looked at the valuations of those companies. They've gone straight up. Now, why have they gone straight up? They've gone straight up because all of us in the developed world are staring at our phones 24 seven. So I think we would agree on that. Everybody's staring at their phone 24 seven or 99% of first world humanity. That's what they're doing. And I think we would also agree that the pandemic woke us up a bit and said, hey, we want to prioritize a little more life and a little less work. So we're staring at our phone. Our new belief system is more life, less work. I'm not saying I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but if you're a CEO, you're running a company and everybody's staying at home and they're not waking up at six in the morning like they used to to go to the gym, drink their coffee and then brave traffic. You're telling me you're telling me that they're getting up on their own. They're doing all those things on their own. They're not staring at their phone while they're home alone. They're actually grinding all day by themselves, which would be the first time ever in the history of the world, right? No, that's not happening. Maybe if, for a few people, like, it doesn't matter to me. If I'm at Disneyland, I'm in Siberia, I'm in the office or not, I'm a grinder. It does not matter. But, but there's very few people that are like that. And so the act, the act of having to put your cleats on and go and get on the field every day, frustrating because that means when you get home, you got to do laundry and you got to squeeze in the dentist and the dog trainer and all those things some other way. I know it's frustrating, but like, so, so what are CEOs thinking? Let me tell you what they're thinking. How do we, how do we move more work offshore? How do we move more work to artificial intelligence? Because, because they're not coming in anyway. They're not giving 100% like they used to anyway. We're doing phone calls while people are on hikes. They're on sailboats. I can't get them. We're trying to, to get everybody together and wrangled for a Zoom call. Half the people are, don't have their cameras on. Like, like, I'm not picking on, my staff's amazing. But like, I'm, again, I'm looking in the mirror. I'm looking at all of us. Like, careful what you wish for. Yeah. Have you looked into incorporating any artificial intelligence into your business? We're using it. We're, we're leaning in heavy. Humanity um, is pushing back on it hard. But like I am so blown away at how powerful this tool is mm -hmm. and how it's going to increase efficiency and, and increase output from every individual. Like 
it's incredible. It really yeah, is. I've, I love playing with it as well. And which ways have you incorporated it into the business? We're, we're using it everywhere. We're trying to use it everywhere. We've got some people in the company. Their sole job is to work with every individual and say, hey, have you considered using it this way? Let's try it. Let's look at it. like, and you know, I was just I was just in the Middle East for the last 10 days. And I've got a person there. We've got a person there who's launching um, an area within the Middle East. And I said, I know exactly what you're going through because I launched Singapore for us years ago. It's very much what you're doing is very much like I, what I did in Singapore, but I didn't have this tool. Have you used it? And she said, no. I said, watch this. I said, this is the country you're in. This is the new partner you have. This is what you're trying to get done. We gave it a bunch of facts, pushed the button. Within 14 seconds, she had a 100 day plan. Yeah. 14 seconds. Here's your 100 day plan. And if you prompt it well, it's rarely half bad. Like for myself, I started playing around with it out of the gate because I was just mere curiosity. What yeah. is this beast? And I do all of this solo as well as the vlogs, et cetera. It's my best assistant. Like you basically took me as a human and you added a little exponent to myself. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think that's maybe some of the misconceptions. So many people are threatened by it. So they're pushing it away. And to your point, humans hate uncertainty. They hate yeah. change. They hate discomfort. And then all of a sudden they have this, is this going to replace me question? Well, it sure as shit is if you don't actually dive in and give it a try, right? Yeah, I, I would become proficient in it fast. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, how it the other thing I'm telling my kids, I've, I've got an 18 year old now. We have four kids and like I want them to go into an office. I want them to be, you know, in before everybody stay late. Like I can't even think of a world where they have to learn alone in a living room. Like it's anyway, you get it. Yeah, no, without question. I mean, it is a, a scary thought and it's changing so fast and we don't one, really one know more, what it looks one, like. One more thought that pisses me off. Yes, love them. Keep them coming. <laughs> the firefighters, they don't get to work from home. Airline pilots don't get to work from home. Military doesn't get to work from home. Like, who the hell are we, right? This subset that says, oh, we're going to work from home, but all those people can't. Yeah, Carpenters aren't working from home. Like, go down the list. Nurses aren't working from home. Doctors aren't working from home. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like the lid has come off. So how do you put everything back in the jar at this point? The yeah. marbles have all fallen out. But I think exactly that. Companies have had to really rejig their strategies because to your point, it's great to say I'm the most productive one. But if your entire staff is saying I'm the most productive one, there's probably a few liars in the bunch. <laughs> like it's to your point, there's a couple that are nailing it, but it's like fitness. We know what is it like 5% actually give her and the rest, the 95%, not so much. And I think that that's such a statistic for life. I know that mental toughness is a huge part of who you are. And I know that that is really like that no BS, like push your comfort zone type of mentality. But I also know that you do have recognition for mental health and it's Derek Gallup that you've partnered with, with the Sparkle Foundation. Why was it important for you to be involved in that space? Because I do think there can be misconceptions when somebody is of that mental tough type of mentality and you're very out there on your public platforms that there isn't that other side of the coin where you recognize that sometimes mental illness can really take hold. Yeah. So my, my belief on the whole thing is when you're going through some stuff and a lot of us are, and, and, and by the way, the self-inflicted stuff we go through is simply because we're too complacent. We're sitting on the couch. We're not grinding. Uh, there, if there's a half a million psychologists in the United States, there's probably like zero in Peru. I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm, you know, silly facetious, but, but like, like if, if you're in a, or, or zero in the favela in Brazil would be a better, or New Delhi, like places where people are fighting for milk, they don't have time. They don't have luxury to sit around and say, you know, I'm really, really upset because my sister wore the same dress that I did to the, to the gala. And it's got me completely upset. Like the I'm things extra laughing because I know what you mean, how brains can be like, I'm going to create 50 problems from that for you now. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm a big believer that if you're fighting for milk and you're grinding, you know, the self-inflicted dark places we go to probably wouldn't exist. Number, number one, number two, uh, a lot of times it's out of our control. Somebody dies, something happens, PTSD, whatever it may be. And, and, you know, no matter where you live, no matter how you grind or not, 
And my answer to that is, look, there's not a lot of choices on how to deal with it. Number one, you could take pills. Number two, you could drink. Number three, you know, self-medicate. You could, you could stay in bed, right? You could detach from community or you can go fucking run. And, and, and you could self-medicate that way. And I've had 10 million people do a race. So I've got a little bit of data. And I got to tell you, every single day, everywhere in the world, what I hear is I'm back with my husband. I'm back with my wife. I lost 200 pounds. I gave up drinking. I gave up drugs. I'm happy again. I started a business. Like, so, you know, maybe I sound like a crackpot telling everybody to do burpees and go run and this and that. And that. It, it's the best alternative to all the other choices. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. So like, and, and by the way, I'm not even selling you something when I say it, because like, if you're in a dark spot and you need a race or 12 of them, just email me, we'll give them to you. Like, I, you know what I mean? It has nothing to do with money. Our, our whole mission is to ch change lives. So like, we know it works. I'm doing this 24 years. I've had a hundred thousand of those conversations. They're writing book. People are writing books on it, literally. So yeah. Yeah. Well, now from the research side as well, the scientific community is just putting published paper after published paper. The exercise itself is more effective than the medication routes out of the gate. So it really is the medicine. I'm curious, though, with you just bringing up taking pills, what is your take on GLP-1s? Because I know that there's a purpose on the obesity side, but we can't deny there's an entire vanity industry around it as well. You know, I was, I, I just told you I was in Saudi and, and uh, they've got a big problem over there in the Middle East in, in general. They, they're, I mean, they don't move. They don't know how to eat. They are, it's a big issue. And it's an issue in the United States too. I guess given the, the best of, of, of alternatives, I'd rather have them taking that drug than not doing anything. And if they take the drug, right? And that gets them to the gym and exercising. I'll take that over not. Would I prefer that the stuff didn't exist and that, you know, whoever the president of the United States was would just pull a fire alarm bell every morning at 5 a.m. and make everybody do burpees and take cold showers and eat salad? Yes, I would prefer that. But I can't even get that to happen in countries where I operate with dictators who want it. I can't get it to happen. Um, so look, if the drug gets, if the drug gets people moving, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, I do think out of, cause it's funny. I, I know Nestle, for example, not too long ago, just put out a press release because they were coming out with an entire food line. Like every company is kind of trying to figure out how do we get the money out of this thing that's going to continue to grow. I mean, the projections through 2030, massive industry financially. So that does make sense. But if there was ever an industry that I do feel makes the most sense to align with this, it is the fitness industry without question, because at the end of the day, it's also combating a lot of the side effects that go hand in hand with it. I had really mixed feelings as it was coming up because I just, I do get a little annoyed when I think of the person that's like, well, I just want to lose weight for so-and-so's wedding next fall. I'm like, then just go to the gym and eat well. Like you don't need to put yourself through something that could have potential side effects, but neither here nor there. One of the things as the fitness industry has asked itself forever is how do we get the other 80% to move? And you try travel a ton. And so, you know, this is a problem. I mean, I'm based in Canada, you're in the States, you're traveling all the time, and we see the same issue over and over again. Why do you feel that we can't seem to get this 80% 80, 80 moving? What's the missing piece? By the way, it, it, let's go back to that work from home thing. The, the human brain, we are all lazy. You're lazy. I'm lazy. I'm, I'm a different level of lazy, and you're a different level of lazy than, than a lot of people, but we're all lazy. And the reason we're lazy is it's kept us alive on the planet for as long as we've existed as a species. Um, if we didn't have that circuit breaker in our brain that says, don't do that, don't expend that energy, don't eat that salad, there's not enough calories there. Don't take those stairs, you're better off taking the escalator. Don't wake up early this morning, you, you need more sleep. Like that circuit breaker is real, it exists, it keeps us from doing hard stuff. Made perfect sense 2000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. We don't, we don't need that circuit breaker today. So 
So those people haven't been taught how much better they feel, why they should do the thing. They just haven't done it long enough to understand that they've got to override that circuit breaker. I got very lucky. You probably got very lucky. I just, you know, my, my kids train so hard for their sport that it becomes addictive. They like the feeling of, of all those chemicals being released in their brain. So like they'll, I'm sure they'll chase it for life. Um, everybody else just doesn't get it. Why would, why would I do, why would, why would I park a mile from the grocery store? Why would I do that? I mean, I, again, I'm just in the middle East. They're bringing me there to help solve this problem. And they want to put me in a golf cart to drive a hundred yards. And I'm like, what the fuck are we talking about? Are you guys crazy? Right. Or, or you go to a fitness convention and there's an escalator on the right, escalator on, stairs in the middle and everybody's on the escalators. What are like, I don't understand. What are we doing? I noticed that at the LA convention center last time I was there and same thing. I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to run up these stairs. What are we here for? Yeah. <laughs> It is so true. I actually, I live in Vancouver, which is very walking friendly city. I, I, we have one of the healthiest populations in my country, but where I was from originally at one point was actually had the highest obesity rates per capita. And when I go back to my hometown and this is in Canada, uh, but when I go back to my hometown, it's so funny because a, we have a Tim Hortons on every corner and the drive through line is always massive. Nobody is parked in the parking lot to walk inside, but B it is that car centric. When you talk about that golf cart going a hundred meters everywhere. And to be honest, I, I, feel like when I lived there, I was guilty of a lot of those habits as well, because you assimilate a little bit into like, this is just what we do. Of course, I'm not going to walk one block to the grocery store. Now I'm like, I pride myself. How many bags can I actually haul back and bring up the stairs? But it is once you've been bitten by it. And I think it is a little bit frustrating that if people just realized how much it could change their lives, eventually they wouldn't need the external motivation because it's something that you crave and something that you know helps body and mind. So with your mission, of course, to change people's lives through fitness, you've gone through this incredible ordeal on the business side. You're coming out the other side and seeing the hockey swing up. So what are the big plans as you're moving forward? I mean, the dream, the dream is to be the Louis Vuitton of hard stuff. So we want to have a bunch of brands that hopefully stimulate different people, different segments of the population to do something hard to get a date on the calendar. I, we believe that for every, every reason you and I just spoke about, we believe that if you don't have a date on the calendar, you're not going to do the work. Um, unless, you know, you get struck by lightning or something happens, like you're just not going to do the work. So we want to be that reason, that purpose, that why people wake up in the morning, do the hard stuff, but somebody might like hiking or mountain biking or paddle boarding, or whatever. So a, you know, a nice portfolio of, of different events located everywhere, uh, every corner of the globe to hopefully inspire folks to tell us more stories about how they got back with their wife or their husband or gave up drugs or drinking. And what type of events do you envision to encompass that full portfolio? We have most of it built already. We just haven't been able to lean in to, to so obviously we have an obstacle between Spartan and Tough Mudder. We've got paddleboard, which is M2O. It's the toughest paddleboard race in the world in Hawaii. We've got uh, La Ruta, toughest mountain bike race in the world in Costa Rica. We've got uh, Highlander Adventure, which is a, a 60 plus mile hiking adventure. We've got Spartan Trail, trail races all over the world. Um, so we've got lots of different brands. DECA, which is our indoor Fitness. Yes, it's coming to Vancouver. You partnered uh, with uh, Fitness World, so we'll be having one here. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it. Uh, you'll probably vomit, but but um, in a good way. Won't be the first or the last time that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember actually the first time I ever had a personal trainer. Don't eat peanut butter before that day comes. First of all, but it's hilarious to me because a my. Uh, bench press were little five pound dumbbells. And I remember my arms just shaking to get through. And then somehow I ended up after that, it's like you have that dry feeling in your throat where you're like saliva has exited the building. And then all of a sudden I'm doing prone leg curls. And that was the moment where I was like, oh no, this is happening. And it was like front out, but he was like a no take shit kind of guy. So it was like, got that out of the system and then back at her. So it's not for everybody, but it is, you feel like you earned something at the end of the day, but okay. <laughs> for yourself with the plethora of modalities out there, 
it's not just people that you're trying to inspire to push themselves and get the wife and the husband back together. You also do a lot of talks for leaders in business. So what are the main, like the three core pillars, let's say, that you really try to instill in them? Because sometimes people are coming for help and to grow, but they don't necessarily like to take the medicine. So what are the ones that you feel they're like, ah, it doesn't taste good, but I probably should do it? Well, it's all the stuff we talk about, right? Waking up early, doing the hard stuff, resetting every every single day, resetting your perspective. I think I think if you get that done, a lot of your life that day, that week, that month falls into place. You're happier. You're nicer to be around. You're going to be more accepting of stuff that goes wrong during the day. Um, when you do this hard stuff together in a community setting, you build bonds with one another. So you're probably not, you're more trustworthy with each other on the team. You're probably not as um, upset over the silly things that happen in the organization or the group. And um yeah, I mean, those those are the big things. And typically, you've got to get people out of their setting, out of where they are, strip them down um, figuratively, right, to a, to a place where they are uh, honest with themselves and honest with the group. And, and when that happens and, and, you know, you see some humility, uh, everything changes. Yeah, it really, it's that vulnerability as well that happens when you take people out of setter setting. No one gets their success, though, alone. And you have had a lot of tremendous success, which obviously you're a go-getter, you're a grinder in your words of just keep going. But who have been the mentors for yourself? Who have you leaned on in times to continue to prosper? Because, to I mean, I'm sure you're at a point now, you could have stopped. You could have stopped and being on that beach sipping a whatever <laughs> yeah i don't like style. i don't i don't like the beach it would have been a mountain i would have been on a trail somewhere hiking a mountain or in a river but my mentors i mean obviously my mom my dad the people from the neighborhood my friends uh there's been a couple of old wise men literally that that i stay in touch with that have helped me through they're in their 80s now and they've kept me on track. There were at least 5,000 times I wanted to quit, but I don't have quit in me. So, you know, what would the average person do? I say to myself, the average person would quit. I don't want to be average. So we're not quitting. Uh, the real tough time was about 12, 15 months ago, the Wall Street Journal called. They were doing a cover story in the bankruptcy section about how Spartan probably wasn't going to make it. It was good clickbait for them. I, for the life of me, I couldn't understand how that was helpful to the world. Here I am trying to get people motivated and they're, you know, taking my legs out from under me. But, but I remembered that in your darkest time is usually when naysayers show up and they pile on. And, and if you could just get through that, you'll be okay. And so I, you know, we hung in there and, and here we are. When something like that's coming up, do you get a heads up before print or how does this all of a sudden end up on your radar? The guy called me, the writer for the Wall Street Journal called me and and I had to take a gulp and and just think like I can't even believe I'm having this conversation. This is so ridiculous. But but again, they you know, everybody's got their motive. And and so um best way the best way to get even with them was to survive and thrive. And so that's what we've done. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean yeah, it's difficult when it's in such a public forum, too. And then they're asking you for comment and you're just kind of like, what the hell? But exactly that you have been not just surviving, but thriving on this flip side. And the fitness industry is in this really exciting trajectory when it comes to a mantra or something that you truly hold on to. What is that one thing for you in those moments that you do remind yourself of to just like connect with the core of yourself? I'm not dead. Everything is better than dead. My mom died. My father died. Friends died. Like, how could I complain about I'm not, I'm not dead. Like, you know, people say, Joe, how was your flight? It landed. It didn't have to land. How could I complain about the flight? You know? And so I have a very low bar. And, and as long as I wake up every day, I'm winning. Yeah, without question. What made you, because obviously you've been someone that decided to propel your message as well, but at what point did you decide you wanted to niche into getting into podcasting and being not just 
somebody that's running a business, but also an influencer in that sector as well. And I mean that in the best connotation of the word influencer. I know it gets a bad rap, but I actually think it can be very powerful for a lot of people to use platforms like that. I didn't want to be an influencer. I, I didn't want to do any of this. I wrote the first book and I was trying to get the word out there. And a buddy of mine who you should have on your podcast, Zach Evanash, um, he called me and he said, Hey, this letter that your team wrote about the book, it's the worst letter I've ever read, you know, read. And like, that's a good friend. <laughs> yeah. And he's, and he's like, like, dude, if you want to get the book out there, you got to do a podcast. And I was like, what's a podcast. So anyway, Barbell shrugged who, who was a very big podcast at the time in the CrossFit world. They came out to the farm and they filmed for like two or three hours with me and they created this podcast. And I thought, you know, if I want to get the word out around the books, around the philosophy or whatever, I probably have to do this. If I choose somebody else to do it, somebody much more handsome, somebody much smarter, so whatever, then I'm going to be beholden to that person. They, they essentially own my, you know, our business, right? If they have a bad day, they don't want to do it. Like, so I have to do it. And so I do it. Um, but truth be told, <laughs> I don't want. I don't want to do it. I, it's not like, I don't. Yeah. Is it cool? By the way, last week, somebody came up to me in the hotel lobby in Saudi and said, Oh my God, Joe. And I'm like, how the hell do you know? I, have you done a race? And he's like, no, but I read the book and I listened to the podcast. I'm like, Oh my God, it's unbelievable. So is that cool? Sure. You pinch yourself and you say, hey, it's pretty cool. You feel cool for a second, but, but the cost you would know better than anybody, you know, the cost to it, not the, not the actual, you know, dollar costs, but it's, it's massive. Yeah. Like elaborate a little bit more of the things that you don't like about it. I mean, you, you gotta be switched on right right now. Just having the conversation with you, I have to be switched on soon as we're done talking, I got to go back to work. I, I expended three times the amount of energy talking to you just because, right. I got to be different. Yeah, fair. So, so I've already done three of these today. Not to take any, oh, you're my favorite, um, but like that's exhausting. Yeah. Right? And I got to do my own and then I got to write an article for LinkedIn and like, I just want to run my business. Yeah. Actually, actually I don't even want to run my business. I just want to run my trails. <laughs> I just want to run. <laughs> Without, yeah, it's so, I guess, like counterintuitive to exactly what makes you tick at the same time. But I do think, and I know that you hear this feedback all the time, but, you know, I see your stuff and, and. For myself, coming from traditional media, I'm slowly shedding my polish. I was trained in a, you have to show up, speak like this. And to be honest, that's why I couldn't do it anymore. I reached a point where I was like, this doesn't feel good anymore. I've got to make a fucking change. And here we are. But for yourself, I do think, even though you do have to put on a level up when you are presenting like that, it's so refreshing to see the no bullshit attitude in the wild and in that space. And so much of social media and these spaces that, to your point, which is a really bad habit if you have this habit because they pick up their phones in the beginning of the day and it's the last thing that they see at the end of the day. But there's so much of it that's a fallacy and just fake shit feeding like the dopamine hits of how people want to feel versus what the reality is. And so I just want to say like kudos to you if it's something that you don't enjoy and that you don't have to do, but that you actually are willing to show up and also be really willing to have a lot of people disagree with you because that I don't care who you are. Like it's easy to be like, eh, I just roll it off. It doesn't matter, but it can feel very personal when it's just your face and your comments, right? It's tough. It's, it's, it's my business. It's my baby. Um, we post stuff and what I've learned is 50% of the people are just not gonna, you know, whatever crazy thing is many times, the more controversial it is, the more it pisses people off, the more followers we obtain. It's a crazy, bizarre phenomenon. Like, like, so look at the end of the day, um, I'll do it as long, as long as it makes a difference, as long as it gets people up in the morning and, 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 and doing hard stuff. But, but, um, yeah, it's exhausting. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, 
I won't take too much of your time because we want to make sure that you do get on a trail today because I'm someone that values my me time greatly. For me, it's like either on my motorcycle or in the gym, getting that state of flow. Because before when you were talking, you were like, I don't like the beach. I don't like that. And I'm always curious about people that are just so into the grind. I'm like, what do you do to relax? But I when get I, it as we went through the conversation. It must just be that. When I lived in, in Vancouver for a year, maybe 300 days out of the whole year, maybe 300, I was on the grouse grind. Nice. I had my kids, I had my wife every single day. She wanted to kill me sometimes two times in a day. Like I love just climbing. I just love it. I just, that, that was awesome. Yeah. And you know, just as well as I do, because for people that aren't from here, it's the hike that like the hike sucks and it's great at the same time it's just stares straight up the vertical is insanity but what i appreciate the most is other people bitten by the bug anytime i'm on there guaranteed there's some like 70 something year old man with walking poles that's like oh i do this three times a week and i'm like yes there's hope for us all if you just keep that determination when that alarm goes off no one's kicking your ass out of bed except yourself agreed but there's power in that so yeah. Joe, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to connect with you. Uh, with the DECA approaching, what should I be doing to prepare? I mean, do that stuff in the gym. So do the obviously do the burpees, do the reverse lunges, right? Do the box jumps, do do the rowing machine, do the ski erg, um, do, do them for time, do them for distance. Uh, believe it or not, you gain a lot. You know this, uh, you've been around fitness, but you gain a lot even at a conversational pace, just doing, you know, time, distance time right like all right i'm gonna do the ski erg for 30 minutes i'm gonna do box jumps for 30 minutes nice and easy you could have a conversational pace but it does it does um positively uh, affect you brilliant well i'll plan to bring my own bucket because nobody wants to be the one that needs cleaned up for but thank you so much for carving the time and space today i do wholeheartedly understand it does take that extra energy so i appreciate you sharing that with me and i look forward to getting my ass kicked all thanks to you and what you started you are awesome thank you you've just listened to the all things fitness and wellness podcast hosted by chrissy van this episode was brought to you by fitness world your fitness your way be sure to hit like and subscribe. We have new podcast episodes weekly featuring industry insiders and influencers. Together, we're on a mission for everyone to live a life fit and well.